Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's look at the final verse of 1 Timothy chapter 4. Paul has been encouraging Timothy to not let anybody look down on him because he's young. Uh, to let his, ev- let his progress be just self-evident to everybody. To not neglect, not neglect the, the gift that was placed within him by the laying on of the hands of the council of elders. Everything kind of gets summed up in the final verse of, of the chapter. Pay close attention to your life and your teaching. Persevere in these things, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and your hearers. All right, so the two things he pays close attention to are his life and his teaching. Pay close attention to these things. His own personal life, because otherwise it's just a, it's just a talk. All right, if, if his personal life, his home, his family, his wife, his kids, if they look at him like he's a sham, then it empties his teaching of its power in the long run. Because that stuff always comes out. I'm so blessed. I'm so grateful that even though ministerially I've been through some hard times, my family has always stayed rock solidly strong. My house has been anointed by the Lord. My marriage is strong. My kids love me. The, the, the Holy Spirit is thick upon the Campbell house. And that means the world to me. It actually matters more to me than what happens within Uh, my preaching ministry, because the preaching ministry is nothing if meanwhile back at home, I'm cheating on my wife and my marriage is falling absolutely apart and I'm not leading my family at all. And my kids all like hate Jesus and hate me and they see that I'm a total fake, that I sell drugs during the week and then uh, preach on Sunday. And they just look at me and they're like, I want nothing to do with that. If my whole family is a sham, if my life is a big fraud, then my teaching might even look good. There are some guys who can keep up the facade and they can teach well because they can keep all of the rot in their family life and their personal life. They can keep that stuff tucked away and hidden well when they can teach well. In the long run, that stuff comes out and it makes you question the teaching. Now, if the man's teaching from the Bible, I've seen God use hypocrites to give some pretty good sermons. And whatever they say from the Bible is still true because even though that guy was not leading his family well and his own family life had some problems, what he said from the Bible was true. So you can't use the failures of a teacher of the word of God to justify your own sin because if what he said was biblical, it's still true. I've seen this happen. I've seen this happen. There's a signature on my ordination certificate from a guy who would later publicly say, like, he disqualified himself from the ministry. It turned out he'd been cheating on his wife for years and years. And uh, so he stepped away, you know, but here's the thing. He was an expositor of the word of God. And so the sermons that he taught were true as long as they didn't put his own personal family life up on a pedestal as an example of it. Everything that he said that was biblical was true. Everything he ever taught me from the Bible is still true. I'm still bound by it. Now, later on, when it came out that his life wasn't what it should have been, it does cast a shadow over his teaching, but it doesn't necessarily need to do that all the time if he's an expositor. If he says something that's biblical, then what he said is true. But in the long run, his teaching ministry got cut off because of his life. He didn't watch his life closely. He watched his doctrine very closely when he would articulate his sermons. They were homiletically quite perfect. They were doctrinally very sound in how they were presented. And what really stinks is that we were robbed of what would have been a really long and robust career of incredible sermons that would still be building up the church today. He watched his doctrine very closely, but he didn't watch his life closely. You gotta watch your life and your doctrine closely. And the result of that is longevity in ministry. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Right? If you're in if you're in a ministerial context and your life is strong, you know, your, your marriage is healthy and you're leading your family well and you're raising your kids in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Man, watch your doctrine closely and preach well to all, all 12 people in your church, all right? Don't worry about the numerical growth. Let God bring that as he brings that. As that 12, 12 grows to 30 and grows to 50, and grows to 100, you may be looking on the internet and seeing these guys who are getting up in front of huge crowds of thousands of people. Um, Look, man, in the long run, if you watch your life and your doctrine really closely, by the time you're done, you'll hit a finish line wherein you may have ministered to more people than that guy. 
because you've watched your life and your doctrine closely over the years. So when God called me to be a pastor, I thought about the world's least successful youth pastor, and I coveted what he had. Uh, I was a drummer, and I was touring and drumming, and that was my plan, just to be a professional drummer, but God called me to be a pastor. And I thought about the world's most successful drummer versus the world's least successful youth pastor. And I was like, I'd rather be the, the, the unsuccessful youth pastor by the world's standards because he, he you know, loves all four of the students in his ministry and he teaches them the Bible and he goes home to his wife and, they, and she kisses him on the cheek and he just sleeps like a baby because he loves his life and he knows he's doing what God called him to do. And then one day those four kids are gonna go out and they're gonna reach more people for Jesus. One of them is gonna be a pastor, the other is gonna be writers and speakers, and one's gonna be a missionary to go lead an entire people group to Jesus or something. And he's just gonna, he's gonna hang his hat in retirement one day on a life well spent. He watched his life and his doctrine closely and he is happier <laughs> than, than the world's most successful drummer. Uh, that's what I believe. That's how God called me. So I, that image has been in my head of the world's least successful, quote unquote, youth pastor. This guy with four kids on a couch who's answering God's calling on his life. He's watching his life and his doctrine closely. Man, what a blessing that is. That's my goal. That's my goal. I want to have, I want to hang my hat on a, a lifetime, you know, of, of faithful doctrine and my own personal life, my family, you know, that, is, that I'm raising my kids well, I'm loving my wife well, leading my family well, my own personal heart, you know, that I'm keeping my sin in check and I repent, I confess when I mess up over and over again until, until, uh, until God calls me home. Persevere, he says in verse 16. It's not just a one-time flash in the pan thing. We've seen a lot of guys come and go. And they show great promise and it's like, wow, this is phenomenal. This guy, I, I, saw, I saw a guy in youth ministry who showed up on the scene and he went from like zero students in his student ministry to 10,000 students. It was the biggest student ministry in the world. And it lasted like maybe a couple of years. And then he just went off the absolute deep end with drugs and it was just gone. He wasn't watching his own life closely. All right, persevere, persevere. Not, not just a flash in the pan momentary thing, persevere in these things. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and your hearers. The Lord is the one who saves souls. And if the pastor is watching his own life and doctrine closely, he evidently is saved. And he's spared the afflictions that come from, you know, a, do a dual life. He's spared from the afflictions that come from compromising the word of God and teaching false doctrine. He is saved, but so are the people who hear him. If his life is intact and his preaching is doctrinally sound, it's a blessing to everybody who hears him. And you don't just do it at one time. You don't just do it for a little while. You persevere in the long run. That's the kind of ministry to which Timothy is called. Likewise, would you persevere? Whether you're called to be a pastor or not, persevere in a life that is led with integrity. It's not like God wants pastors to have their family life intact and come to church and be the same guy, and then you can have an absolute dual life. No, if you're not a pastor, it doesn't mean that the standard is lowered for you in this regard. You may not be judged more strictly as a teacher, but it doesn't mean that your life can be absolute chaos. When you come to church, even if you're not getting up on the platform to, to, to speak and to teach, you're still participating in worship. You don't need to feel like a sham when you do that. Would you come to church with your integrity intact? Because your life is in order. Your family life is healthy. That's a blessed thing. And it's not just a season, it's a perseverance, a matter of perseverance. You weather storms and you emerge on the other side, your faith still intact. Your family goes through hard times, but you experience healing. You repent from sin where it's necessary. You reconcile where you must, and you persevere for the long haul. So you keep coming back to church. Even if you're not preaching, you're participating in worship. You're part of the body of Christ, singing worship songs to God. That matters, man. That, that's incredibly important. That's eternally significant. I need you there. And I need you to persevere in that. Watch then your life and your doctrine closely as well.